We're going to move on now to an area of the syllabus which, for many years, was not actually tested that much. In recent papers, it seems to be being tested a little bit more frequently. The good news is that it's not desperately difficult, it's not very technical. This area is called practice management. It's not about practicing at management, it's about managing a practice. A practice being a firm of accountants. So this area is about those sort of issues which maybe the senior partner of a firm of auditors would want to consider. So what do we think that the senior partner of a firm of auditors worries about? Well, presumably, at the top of the list is not ending up in court. Reputation. And the easiest way to not end up in court is to do good quality audit work in the first place. So quality control is going to be at the top of the list. But of course, there's no point being good at this if you don't have any clients. So issues surrounding the obtaining and keeping of clients are also important. So we need to take a look at advertising, making sure people know you exist. Tendering, the process by which a few firms of auditors are shortlisted and have to fight it out amongst themselves to win a client. And fees. How do auditors actually set their fees? And are there any professional issues involved in that? Of these four areas, quality control has probably been tested more than any of the others. The new examiner has tested both quality control and tendering, but we've not had much on advertising and fees in recent years, either from this examiner or the previous one. So taking them maybe in order of importance, we'll start with quality control, then tendering, and then we'll take a look at advertising and fees together. So firstly, quality control. Control. What is quality control? Well, having studied the F8 paper, you've heard of internal controls, and internal controls are things that companies do, organisations do, to try to control the performance of the company. So quality control is simply internal controls in firms of accountants to try to control the quality of the work that is done. And as such, it's a relatively straightforward area. Typically with quality control, we would split it into two areas. Quality control within the firm as a whole, in other words, trying to create an overall environment which is quality, and then some individual quality control issues for each piece of work we actually do. Let's first of all think about quality control for the firm as a whole. If any of you have ever tried to get a job at a firm of accountants, you'll understand that the recruitment process is very tight and challenging. Accountancy firms are very keen to get the right people, and so you will probably have to have more than one interview, maybe do some tests, assessments. It's a very, very hard process. And once they've recruited you, you'll then get loads and loads of on-the-job training. But there's no point doing all of that if once you actually get into the office, the overall culture or attitude, which you would hope is something which is pushed by the partner's behaviour themselves, is one that does not support quality. So we need an environment 
that is high quality. And that means the partners having a very strong attitude towards quality. To help this, it's likely that the partners will appoint some partners to focus on quality. They'll probably be technical partners, partners who don't have clients themselves, but just try to make sure that the firm's procedures and policies are up to date. Big firms especially will have specialists or access to specialists in all major areas and will encourage all partners and staff to seek consultation with these people wherever there is any doubt as to the right answer in a given situation. We also, when doing ethics, came across something called a hot review. Checking the audit work before the job is finished wherever there is any suspicion it could have gone wrong. As part of a more overall quality control environment, firms are also likely to do something called cold reviews. This involves, maybe on a six-monthly basis, selecting some finished work from each partner's portfolio and doing a detailed check on what's been recorded to ensure that quality levels are being maintained. It is, of course, too late to put those problems right because the work's already been finished it's done in order to learn for the future and stamp out problems as soon as possible. It's a bit like that phone call you get sometimes after you've bought something, where a company rings you up and says, was the whole process to your satisfaction? Did you get good customer service? Obviously, if you got bad customer service, it's probably too late, but they're looking to learn for the future. So there are a few examples of how audit firms try to attain quality overall. But what about quality on each individual job? What can we do for each client as part of the process to try to ensure good high levels of quality control? Well, the starting point is before you even say yes to a client. One way to guarantee you do bad quality work is not to carry out any pre-appointment checks. Just say yes to something without checking it out first. What if you don't fully understand the company or the industry in which it's in? What if you say yes to a job and only then realise you don't have enough staff or time to do it properly? Things like that can easily lead to bad quality control. So the starting point are the pre-appointment checks that audit firms regularly carry out. Once you have carried these out and said yes to a client, the whole process needs to think about quality. That means planning your work before you actually start doing it. It means making sure that every member of the team has seen that plan and had it explained to them, maybe during a planning meeting, before the work starts. And it involves documenting everything that is done and the reasons for everything that is done so that anyone checking this work afterwards can clearly see and understand that audit process.
And then there's the people involved. Don't forget, many people in an audit team won't have the experience or, in fact, the qualifications to do it on their own. As such, work needs to be properly directed by senior people. All junior staff should be carefully supervised. And, of course, the work of all staff should be reviewed by someone more senior. And then there's the case of who does what. Some elements of audit work can be relatively straightforward. Checking a bank reconciliation, for example, or inspecting fairly basic assets just to prove they exist. Presumably, these sorts of tasks would most likely be given to the more junior members of staff, with the more complicated bits being left to more senior people. Having said that, of course, it's an essential part of training that junior staff are sometimes involved in some more difficult tasks, otherwise they'll never be able to do it. But in a general sense, work should be delegated based on skills and experience. Now, hopefully, you can see from these lists that quality control is not the most complicated area in the world. It just needs a bit of common sense thinking to go behind it. One aspect of quality control that has been tested a couple of times is the difficulty that smaller firms of auditors may have in achieving good levels of quality. After all, a small firm of accountants may struggle to spend the money and time on detailed recruitment procedures. Equally, if you've only got one trainee, you can't invite people in to run training courses for one person. It's uneconomical. Also, smaller firms probably lack the specialists and also the general experience so that when something complicated comes along, they may struggle to know how to deal with it because they've simply never come across it before. So in smaller firms, there is a danger of mistakes being made due to a lack of checking and a lack of skills and experience. There are some things that smaller firms can do about this. Institutes typically give advice where members want it. And also, many small firms have paired up with other small firms and shared their skills and experience. In fact, there are some groups of firms which have dozens of members. Cooperatives, such that things like joint training schemes can be put on. If you have 15 firms with one trainee each, that's 15 people who may all need the same training. Those firms can try to make sure that if one firm has a specialist in one area, another firm will try to get a specialist in a different area, so that when you add all the firms up together, they can all help each other out, and they can also review each other's work, just to add some independence to that process. The firms themselves retain their independence and individual status, but sharing things like this can really help with quality control. Well, that's it for quality control. What we need to do now is look at other areas of practice management, and the next area we're going to look at is tendering. Tendering is the process by which a company creates a short list of potential suppliers of a product or service, and then tries to choose between those on the short list to come to a final decision. So when companies choose their auditors, typically they do not just go and find one firm and say, we'd like it to be you. Larger companies especially will often invite three or four firms to pitch for the work. In other words, to do some sort of presentation, which might be physical, like this one, or might be sending in a document, trying to explain why our firm should be selected by that company. So, how could this come up on the exam? Well, there's really only one question that could be asked, as far as I can tell. How do companies choose their auditors? 
What factors do they consider? Although it could be asked in a different way, albeit with the same answer, which is, imagine your firm has been asked to make a presentation to try to win a client, what would you put in it? Well, presumably, if companies consider these five factors, those are the five things you'd put in your presentation, wouldn't you? It's the same issue, same answer. Which raises the question, what are those factors? What do companies consider when choosing their auditors? Well, you may currently be thinking this is a difficult area because you've probably not been involved in choosing auditors, so how on earth would you know? The good news is that choosing auditors is pretty much like choosing anything else, be it a pair of shoes, a sandwich at lunchtime, or maybe the training college where you do your accountancy exams. So, rather than picking some auditors, which most of us haven't done, let's try and choose the college where we might attend to train as an accountant. And let's think about the factors we'd consider. So how would you choose your college? What are the key issues? Presumably you'd like to pass, enjoy passing, and do it without bankrupting yourself. So here are a few of the things I'd consider if I was choosing a college to go and study accountancy at. Now, those are a few things that jump straight to mind regarding how I might choose my college. Uh, I haven't put pass rates on there, although, of course, I could, um, because I don't really think that pass rates are something which we could translate into a company choosing their auditors. I mean, could you really choose your auditors based on the percentage of audit reports that firm issues qualifications in? It's not the most independent way of picking, is it? Deli deliberately picking a firm who never find mistakes? I'm not sure that's a very good sign at all, is it? But if we look at the other things on this list, if you were picking a firm of auditors, you'd want a firm with nice people who you get on with. They will, after all, be coming into your company. And you'd like some decent customer service so that when you ring the firm up, the phone is answered quickly, politely, and you get answers to your questions. That must apply to virtually anything in life. Price. How important is price when it comes to picking your auditors? Well, interestingly, not only is it important, but potentially it's important in a way that is different to what you're assuming. In a recent survey of big companies in the UK, many big company directors said they would be attracted to the most expensive audit firm, not the cheapest, because they assume that the main cost of audits is the staff involved, and therefore high cost suggests high salaries, which probably suggests better quality people. An interesting finding. It is also, of course, a very stupid thing for them to have admitted to, because now audit firms may well choose to put their prices up to make it look like they've got good staff, even if they haven't. Location. Well, with auditing, you don't go to your auditor's office. The auditors come to you. So why is location important? It's not like you have to go there. Well, you may have to go there from time to time, but of course, if the auditors have to get to you, there is time and money involved in that. 
And think about location in a wider sense. If your company is planning overseas expansion at some point, having auditors who have offices overseas would be useful. So it's not just local location, it's location in a more international sense. Services available. When you choose your college to do ACCA exams, you may well want to go for a college that offers other qualifications as well, so that if, for example, after ACCA you wanted to do an MBA, going with a college who could offer that would mean you could carry on with the same place that you know and hopefully love. Likewise, companies, when choosing auditors, want to know that things like tax advice, corporate finance advice, etc., would be available should they need them, even if they don't need them now. Reputation, of course, is critical with anything in the financial world. Potentially, if I'm trying to win a client, I may well approach some of my existing clients and ask if they wouldn't mind having their names put into my proposal so that the potential client could call them and discuss the service that my existing clients have achieved. The problem with this process is that, of course, as a firm, I will surely just choose clients who I know to be very happy with me, which, of course, means that when the other company contacts them, they'll always and only hear good news. So I'm not sure this idea of references is actually that helpful. And, of course, experience. Potentially specialist experience in this industry. Companies want to know they're going to get a good service and a personal service, and they want firms of auditors who know what they're doing and understand the issues. Now, clearly, this is not the most difficult area in the world. You can completely forget about accountancy and just think about choosing anything. Because, as I said earlier, whether you're choosing a sandwich, a pair of shoes, where to go and buy a pet dog, where to go out for dinner, or your accountancy college, to be honest, most of the issues are the same. Price, quality, reputation, people. So it's not a difficult question if it comes up, which probably explains why it doesn't come up very often. We're going to move on now to look at the world of advertising and fees. This has historically been the least examined area of practice management. We'll start off by looking at fees, for which there's not a lot for you to know, and then we'll take a look at a question from when this has come up to help us look at advertising. Firstly, fees. Firms of accountants typically charge for things by counting up the number of hours of work that have been done and then multiplying those hours by an hourly charge-out rate for each member of staff involved. And yes, as you would expect, the partner's time is going to cost you a little bit more per hour than the time of the more junior staff. But how do you set those charge-out rates? Do you want to be the most expensive firm, the cheapest firm, or somewhere in the middle? Don't forget, potentially, how much you charge gives an indication of the quality of your work. Trying to price yourself cheaply might win some clients, but it might actually make some clients think you're simply not good enough. But anyway, those are more sort of commercial issues. What about professional issues for this course? Well, really, there are only a couple of issues regarding fees that we need to consider. The first of those is lowballing.
Sometimes when you go to shops, say a big supermarket, they'll have special offers. Sometimes the special offers almost seem too good to be true. And you can't help wondering, is the supermarket actually making any profit on this item by selling it so cheaply? Well, potentially they're not. That's not the point. What they're trying to do is entice you into the shop in the hope that by the time you've got to the special offer, often at the back of the shop, you've walked past so many other items, you've picked up some full price ones as well. Even if they put the special offers at the front of the shop, so they attract people in off the street, in order to get to the till and pay for the items, you have to pass virtually everything else. Well, supermarkets may do it. The question is, can audit firms price audits really cheaply in the hope of attracting clients and then either putting the price up in the future or making their money instead by other services they sell to those clients? Is that acceptable? Is it ethical? Is it professional? Well, in most countries, there's actually nothing to stop you doing it. That may be for philosophical reasons. In other words, no one really sees it as a bad thing. Or it may be because it's very, very difficult to actually prove anyone's doing it. I mean, selling something cheaply might be because you're just very efficient at doing it. But if you are lowballing, what are the potential problems with it? Why are we even discussing it as a potential problem? Well, the thing is, if you price something very, very cheaply, it may give the indication it's not very good. And of course, if you know you're not earning that much money from something, isn't there a danger you don't choose to do it very well, as you don't see it that important? So it can give the message to clients, and maybe even members of the audit team, that the audit process itself is not seen of much high value and that you're only doing this because you want to do other stuff for this client instead. And that's not a very healthy situation. We need audits to have a high reputation, and this might be a problem. The ACCA's view on lowballing is, as of many countries, you are allowed to do it, although the ACCA would prefer you not to. And if you're going to do it, you must make it absolutely clear to the client that they are getting a special low price because you're hoping they'll love you so much they'll want to use you in the future or buy other things from you. As long as you do that and make the client aware you'll be doing a proper audit in all its full glory, then that is fine. But if there is the slightest indication or suspicion that the quality of your work will suffer, you shouldn't be doing it. In some countries... Lowballing is effectively against the law. One way to do this, as in some Eastern European countries, is for the government to calculate a minimum audit fee for any company. For example, a multiple of their sales figure. Or a percentage of some other number in their financial statements. The danger with this is that the government says that's the minimum fee, no one should do it cheaper than that, but of course now the company looks at that fee and says to any firm of auditors, if the government says that's an acceptable fee, I don't want anyone charging me any more than that. So potentially audit firms find themselves unable to negotiate on fees because the government absolute minimum becomes the company's absolute definite. That's the only fee they'll accept. Well, that's lowballing, something which hopefully you came across when you studied F8. And there is one other fee issue for this paper, and that is contingency fees. You should have heard of contingent liabilities. This is something to do with financial statements. They are liabilities that are contingent, in other words, depend on some future event. So a company with a court case, for example, 
may well have a contingent liability disclosed in their financial statements, with an explanation that there is a court case going on, and if that court case goes badly, they might have to pay some money. Contingency fees are fees that professionals earn where the fee is dependent on some future event. The danger with this is that auditors might look at the fees that they might earn, try to work out what event will lead to the highest fee, and then ensure that event happens, which surely means they're not being objective. For example, imagine that a company comes to you and says, we'd like you to be our auditor. The problem is we don't know how much we can afford to pay you until you finish checking the accounts to see just how profitable we've been. So how about you take 10% of the profits as your audit fee? Of course, now there is a danger that the auditors will ignore mistakes that make the profits go down and maybe invent some mistakes that make the profit go up to maximise their fee. And even if they don't do that, the outside world may assume they've done that. Likewise, a tax advisor may advertise and say, if I can't make your tax bill go down, I won't charge you any professional fees. Well, what does that say to the outside world? What sort of message does that give? It may give the message, to some people at least, that that tax advisor will do absolutely anything, and I mean anything, to make the tax bill go down to ensure they get paid a fee. The ACCA's views on contingency fees are fairly clear. No contingency fees. Nice and simple. From fees, we're going to move on to advertising. Now, ask yourself this question. Have you seen firms of accountants advertising? And if so, can you remember what you saw and where you saw it? If you watch television, you probably don't see too many firms advertising there. You may not have heard too many firms advertising on the radio. And you probably haven't seen that many adverts in some newspapers. So the question is, where do firms advertise, how do they advertise, and why? Well, there aren't any rules as such for advertising, but we must remember accountants need to appear professional. And there is a danger with advertising that potentially accountants may not appear professional if they choose an interesting place to advertise, an interesting manner to advertise. So accountants need to be very careful as to how they do this. And here are a few basic guiding points should a question come up. So, any advertising done by accountants, number one, must be clear. There's a danger that if you lack clarity, people might believe that you're offering services that you're not actually offering. And, of course, sometimes a lack of clarity might suggest you're willing to be unprofessional, unethical, or maybe even break the law for your clients. And we wouldn't want people to believe that. If you're going to make any claims, they must be backed up. Adverts stating that you are the best firm of auditors in the world are not acceptable, unless last year you won the world's best firm of auditors from some organisation. You must not criticise other accountants. There are some industries where one company will often refer to their competitors in their adverts, 
and probably the competitor does the same back again. But this is seen as somewhat childish and unprofessional. You cannot say, come and let us do your audit, because Deloitte and Ernst & Young are rubbish. That is not acceptable. And by the way, they're not rubbish. And finally, the overall manner, location of your advertisement must be professional. The reputation of the industry can be affected if your firm does something which is seen as unprofessional. Now, those issues seem relatively obvious and maybe are not that surprising and, of course, are another reason why firms of accountants don't advertise on television much. I mean, imagine an advert from a firm of accountants. You only can deal in facts, you can't make wild claims, as many adverts sometimes seem to, and it's all got to appear very professional and presumably, therefore, fairly boring. Hello, I'm a firm of accountants. I do audit and tax. I'm reasonably good at it, according to my clients, and last year I was ranked 37th in London. It's not exactly the most thrilling advertisement in the world, is it? What we're going to do now is take a look at an exam question in which we have some advertising and, in fact, fee-related issues and use the knowledge we've built up to come to an answer plan.